Listen, if you've got your Bibles, go ahead with me this morning and turn to Romans chapter 5. Okay, Romans chapter 5. While you're getting there, let me just again say that it is awesome to be back in God's house. This is phase one. This is step one. And as we, uh, as we come back, we know that we are just inching our way back toward normalcy. So these are our first steps in getting here. And I'll have to say that uh, over the last couple of months, I have learned a lot. Uh, I have, I've been in the ministry 25 years, and I've always wanted to take a sabbatical. I had no idea it would come in this form or fashion. And, uh, and, and it wasn't really a sabbatical. Over that time, I learned how to be a TV evangelist. I grew my hair out. It has been, uh, it's been interesting to, uh, I have to admit, I got an illegal haircut during that time. It's been interesting to see everybody else's homemade haircuts and our ways of learning to entertain ourselves during a time like this. And uh, so it's been interesting to say the least. And to be honest with y'all, I, I told the first service, I had these grandiose ideas uh, about what today would be like as we came back. I've been really since the first week we couldn't meet, I've been anticipating the time that we would get to come back and be together and in my mind, I thought, you know, I'm going to preach this great comeback sermon. You know, I'm going to, I'm going to preach. There's, there's all kind of great comeback stories in the Bible. And I thought, I'm going to preach this great comeback sermon, you know, um, where, where God's people come back and, and, and everything is awesome and we worship together and, uh, you know, that kind of thing. And it just wasn't there. Uh, it wasn't the right thing. I felt like God was just saying, we need to stay in Romans. It was just not right. It was, it was the wrong thing. I, I, I told him in the first service, we took a little trip to the beach last weekend, a, a quick getaway, and while we were there uh, on Saturday, we had been out on the, out on the beach, out at the pool, and uh, my, my, the big kids uh, had gone ahead and gone inside, and Sharon went to the pool with Jay, and I, I told them, I said, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go running on the beach. Um, as you can tell, I, I haven't been running a lot, um, but I did decide that day, I'm, for whatever reason, I'm going to go run on the beach. And so I took off for a run, and I ran about a mile and a half uh, one way, and then turned around and came back. And by that time, I was tired, right? And so my head was kind of down. I really wasn't paying attention. I run up on the, you know, the big long boardwalks, the boardwalk that goes from your, from the condo out to the beach. I run up on the boardwalk, and I'm looking for my flip-flops. And, and on this boardwalk, it had these little cubbies, like, like that you put your flip-flops in or your sandals. And I get to looking, and my, my sandals are gone. They're, they're gone. I, I was like, some idiot stole my flip-flops while I was running on the beach. I was upset. I was mad. I mean, I was ticked off. I was like, "Who? why would somebody steal my sandals? I asked a couple of people that were there like they would know and like they would admit it if, if they did. I said, hey, did you happen to see a pair of blue Chacos, a pair of sandals? No, man. I haven't seen them. Can't believe somebody would steal something like that. And, so, and then I saw a guy who had like several pairs of sandals walking out from the beach, so I followed him. And I'm kind of looking just to see if he's got mine. And it, he, they weren't. I'm looking around. Um, we had reserved a beach chair. It was gone. I was like, this is weird. And so I finally call Sharon. I call her or I call her on my phone and I said, hey, did you get my sandals out of the little cubby thing on the on the on the boardwalk when you went up to the to the pool? No. Did you lose them? No, they got stolen. And I said, I'm mad about it. And she's like, they got stolen, seriously. So anyway, I go and look a little bit more. I finally decide, well, I'm just going to walk back. I'm going to go to the lobby. So I walk back up the boardwalk to the pool. I go over the bridge. It goes over the pool. I'm looking. Sharon's gone. I was like, that's weird. I just talked to her. She's gone. I walk into the condo, and it had a, there were four elevators, like in a, in, a, in a lobby area. I walk in. I push the button to go up to the main lobby. I'm standing there. I go up and I get up there and there's a line and so I get in the line, socially distanced, mind you. I'm doing it the right way, I'm standing in line, waiting my turn. 
I'm about to walk up to the lady at the desk, and Sharon sends me a text that says, you big idiot, you're at the wrong condo. <laughs> so I look around, and I'm at the wrong condo, or at least she says I am. I walk back outside. We were staying at the Phoenix 7. The Phoenix 6 is right next door. They're identical. The, the pool is the same. The bridge is the same. The boardwalk is the same. The cubbies are the same. The, when you walk in, the elevators are the same. The table with the hand sanitizer on it by elevator number one is exactly the same. The lobby's the same. The counter's the same. The furniture's the same. I wasn't sure if the person was the same because I figured they'd change it out, but it, I was at the wrong condo. I walked back outside. The only difference is that one had umbrellas around the tables, around the pool. One was royal blue, and the one next door where we were staying were teal. Oh, it was the only difference. We would have never known. I just didn't look up. I didn't see it. It was wrong. I was in the wrong place. And so I'm saying all that to say my grandiose ideas about like this great comeback story. We've been out for COVID-19 and the church finally comes back. God's people rise again kind of thing. It was just not, it was not what I was supposed to teach today. I felt very strongly that God wanted us to stay right where we've been in our series in Romans chapter 5. It's been weird. It's been a little bit weird to like carry on through that, talking to a camera, knowing that people have been watching. Listen, this church has been awesome through this. And I know a lot of people are watching right now. And, and it's been awesome. And we're not completely through it yet. We're working in phases. And this is way different. And we don't know what to expect. And I just want to say y'all are an awesome church. I told the first service this. Um, you know, it, it was. It, it's, you're an awesome church, and it's been it's been cool to see God's people respond, and um, and see how strong God is through this. And so, we're supposed to go to Romans today, and I tell you, there are certain passages of Scripture that just kind of stand out in God's Word. They're like mountain peaks that kind of just come out of the ground out of nowhere. And I've had the privilege in my life of of traveling to some pretty cool places. Um, and I've seen some pretty awesome mountains. I've been to the Rockies. I've been to the Andes Mountains uh, in, in Peru, been to the Alps, seen Mount Huascaran and Mount Jungfrau and Pikes Peak and some cool places. And if you've ever seen a mountain like that, and I bet a lot of you have, those kind of mountains, they just rise up out of nowhere. And you're like, man, that is just crazy that it's like that it's like that. In Romans chapter 5, verses 6 through 11, where we are this morning, is one of, is, is one of those. It's a mountain peak that just kind of rises up. It's John 3, 16. It's a Psalm 23 kind of thing. You, you're with me and you comfort me. It's a, it's a Philippians chapter 4 kind of thing. To God be the glory forever and ever and ever. And, and so Romans 5 is that. It's one of those, it's one of those mountain peaks. Um, in scripture. And so we're going to read it together, Romans chapter 5, verses 6 through 11. We did this in the first service as well. I'm going to ask everybody that's watching at home because, listen, we've been watching, we've been doing church laying on the couch for the last couple of months. And so we're back. So I'm going to let y'all, if y'all would, just, we'll get our motors running here. Y'all stand with me this morning as we read this scripture. It'll be on the screen for those of you that are watching. We're in Romans chapter 5, verses 6 through 11. The scripture says, for while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Can I get an amen from the floor on that? Amen, right? And, and verse 9 says, Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. And more than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. Y'all can be seated. We're going to take, uh, here's, the, here's the awesome thing about this. We're, we're going to hit this hard and heavy. We're going to get what God has for us. But it's going to be pretty quick. These are 45-minute worship services. The crowd goes wild. It's what everybody's been praying for for years. It's the 45-minute worship service, right? Um, 
In this scripture, we get a clear portrayal of the gospel of Jesus Christ, and that's what makes it a mountain peak in scripture. These verses show us our need for Christ, and it shows us God's remedy. And, and I want you to see some things with, with me in this scripture. So if you, uh, we don't have our regular newsletters. Those of you at home, it's probably going to be easier for you to take notes. Um, some of you may have printed them off. If, you got, if you're writing your Bible, whatever you do, if you need to take a mind note, that's fine, whatever it is. We'll, we'll have these things on the screen as well. But I want you to notice some things in the scripture with me. First of all, we'll, we'll just make it pretty simple. I want you to notice our big problem. We have a huge problem, and we see it spelled out in verse 6, verse 8, and verse 10. And to make it simple, we just kind of see our honest standing without Christ, who we are naturally. First of all, verse 6 says that we are weak. Some translations say powerless. We are, in and of ourselves, we are weak. Verse 6 also says that we are ungodly. Verse 8 says that we are sinners. And verse 10 says that we are God's enemies. So here it is, put it all together, verse 6, 8, and 10. By nature, every human being is a weak, ungodly, sinning enemy of God. Wow, thanks Murph, Thank, thanks for the welcome back to church after two months. Telling us that we are all weak, ungodly, sinning enemies of God. That list honestly describes the spiritual state of every person in the world apart from God. Anybody that doesn't know Christ, we, we, we have, if we've not found the remedy for that through Christ, then that's our, still our standing. That's who we are naturally. We are weak, ungodly, sinning enemies of God. Let's look at those things real quick this morning. First of all, we're weak. Like I said, some versions say powerless. It means helpless. It means we're without strength. Paul's saying that as we stand before God, we're completely powerless to change our basic nature on our own. There's an old phrase that says, God helps those who help themselves. Have you heard that before? It's not a biblical phrase. The biblical view is radically different. God actually helps those who can't help themselves. Or if you prefer, God helps those who are willing to admit that they cannot help themselves. We are helpless. We are, power we are powerless. We are weak. People, honestly, people may be able to change a few patterns in their lives, a few habits can do a few good things apart from Christ. People can do good things, but you can never change your basic nature by self-effort. It simply is not possible. We are powerless to change our basic nature. It, it has to be changed through the power of Christ. It's the only way it can happen. Secondly, we saw in verse 6 that we are by nature ungodly. One commentator explained the word like this, that we are mighty in evil. We, in other words, as human beings, our natural tendency is to invent our own morality. We live to please ourselves. We live to go our own way. We do that which is right in our own eyes, says the scripture. In short, we set ourselves up as God, and then we worship ourselves. By nature, we are selfish. The, the third phrase is that, is that we are sinners. We saw that in verse 8, and it describes the futility of our lives without Jesus Christ. Apart from him, we miss the mark, don't we? That's what the phrase in verse 8 means. It literally means that we miss the mark. It's the picture of the archer who takes aim. Now, I'm not a hunter, and some of you probably know that because I've hunted with a few of you, and I'm not very good at it. And I'm certainly not good with the bow and arrow. And, but it's like an archer who would, who would take aim, who, who, would, who would draw back the, draw back the bow, draw back the arrow, he pulls the bowstring, he shoots the arrow, but he misses the entire target. He thought he was aiming at the right place, but something happens and the arrow never hits the target. No matter how many arrows he shoots, the result is still the same. He misses the mark. That's what it means to be a sinner. You try and you fail. You try and you fail. You try and you fail. You always fall short. Now, the final phrase describes our life without Jesus. We are therefore, because we are separated from God, we are his enemies. It literally means that we are by nature hostile to God. Before you came to Christ, if you're a Christian this morning, before you came to Christ, you were one of God's enemies. But you say, well, I always loved God. No, you didn't. 
You, you, you didn't. We, we're enemies of, of God. So if we reject the Son, then we don't truly love God. So anyone that's without Christ is an enemy of God. And we were all that until we came to know Christ. So let's sum that all up. Y'all sum it up with me. To, to, we, are, we are weak or powerless. It means we can't change our basic nature. To be ungodly means that we live as if God doesn't exist. To be a sinner means we constantly try and we try and we try and we miss the mark. To be an enemy means that we have hostility toward God and we have a rightful fear of facing Him someday because we don't know Christ. If we do know Christ, it changes all that. So God has judgment on the, on the entire human race because of our sin. No one's excluded. It doesn't matter how famous, how rich, how accomplished someone may be. We still need Jesus Christ, don't we? You can search the four, four corners of the globe and you find no exceptions to the truth. There are, you won't find a man, woman, boy, or girl that's not a sinner. All of us by nature are powerless, ungodly enemies of God. So because of that, because we are that, here's the deal. Go here with me for a second. Here's the deal. There's no reason for God to love us. No reason except this. There's no reason for God to love us because we are sinful enemies of God. The only reason He loves us, loves us is because He chose to. He chose to. He loves you and He loves me because God is love and He can't help loving us even though we're His enemies because He chose to do that. His love, get this, His love is both greater than our sin and in spite of our sin. God shouldn't love us. I mean, why would He? But He does. And that's the wonder of it all, that God would love His sworn enemies. That means God's love is sure because it doesn't depend on anything you or I say or do. Now, that's our big problem, is that we're all of those things that we just talked about apart from Jesus. But verses 7 and 8 give us our second thing this morning. Not only do we have a big problem, but here's the awesome thing. Number two this morning is we see God's great solution in this mountain peak scripture. Notice in this scripture that we see God's incredible solution to man's impossible problem. Verses 7 and 8 reveal the unearthly nature of God's love. His solution to our problem is so unusual that it goes far beyond human reason. We would never have thought this up on our own. Only God could conceive of this solution. And two, say, two statements kind of summarize this truth. Verse 7, we see that God went far beyond what we would have ever done. God went far beyond what we would ever do. Here's what he did. He died for us. Now here's a good question to discuss over lunch today. How many people are you willing to die for? Seriously, um, honestly, if the chips were down, the moment came, the split second that you had to make that decision, how many people would you really, really be willing to lay your life down for? No, hesita no hesitation, no reservation. You know, I think about the jerk that I kind of just make myself like, and if the bullet's coming, I'm probably stepping out of the way and letting the bullet go by, right? Probably only a handful of people, your spouse, your children, your parents, perhaps a few close friends. People will die for something they love, something they want to defend, something they protect. It, it makes me thankful for those who died for our country. They believed in it. The soldier who throws himself on a grenade to save his unit. The dad who would step in front of the bus and push his kid out of the way. And our text today agrees with that. We would die for something that, that we love or that we care about. Our text is telling us that all of us would die for a few other people or for something that really mattered. Close friends, family members, people we greatly admire. But that's a very, very small number of people. To be, to be honest, there are many people we love that we, that we care about, but we're not so sure if we take a bullet for them, right? Right? There's some people we would die for, but the circle is small, I guess is what I'm trying to say. But listen carefully. Romans chapter 5, verse 7 is telling us that God's love is not like that. We might die for a loved one or a friend. We might die for our country. As great as that is, God's love is much greater. 
God went far beyond what we would do. We wouldn't do what God did. And what I'm getting at comes out in verse 8. We might die for someone we have a reason to die for, but look at what God did. Verse 8 says, But God demonstrates His own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. When we read it, we like to emphasize Christ died for us, but the emphasis should be on the rest of it. The wonder is not that Christ would die for us, I mean, even though that would be wonderful enough, the wonder is that Christ died for us while we were still sinners, still ungodly, still powerless, and still enemies of God. He didn't die for his friends. God died for his enemies. Jesus died for those who crucified him. He died for those who hated him. He died for those who rejected him. He died for those who cheered as the nails were driven through his hands and feet. He did something 2,000 years ago that only God could have done and would have done. He didn't die for good people. He died for bad people. He didn't die for saints. He died for sinners. He didn't die for his friends. He died for his enemies. He didn't die for people who loved him. He died for people who hated him. We would not do something like that. We might die for our friends, but never for our enemies. But that's what Jesus did for us. The death of Jesus is the final proof of God's love. Sometimes in this crazy, mixed-up world, people say, where's the love of God? I mean, we know it. We see so much killing, so much hatred, so much heartache, so much tragedy, so much pain, so much anger. Where is God in the midst of this pandemic? Why did COVID-19 have to happen? If God cared, we wouldn't be going through this. And all as we can say as believers, because we count it as true, and it's in our hearts, and because we know Christ, all we can say is look at the cross and see the love of God. See it from his head to his hands to his feet. Somebody once said, Lord, how much do you love me? You've probably seen it on a picture before. This much, he said, and he stretched out his arms and he bowed his head, and he died. You can't read Romans chapter 5, verses 6 through 11 this morning and doubt that God loves you. Does he love you? Yes, he absolutely does. He proved it. He gave the great solution when he died on the cross for you and me. So this morning we've seen our big problem. We see God's great solution. And then third, in this mountain peak of Scripture, we see in verses 9 through 11, our unmerited Again. So one question's left. If, if Jesus has died for us, what difference does it make? What have we gained by his sacrifice? Is, is Jesus' sacrifice on the cross, is it just an event in history and nothing more? Is it just one more religious act that we have to look at in the 21st century and decide is that real or not? What difference does the cross make for you and me? Paul answers those questions in Romans chapter 5, verses 9 through 11. He does it by linking the death of Christ to our personal experience. He says very clearly that for a person who's trusted in Jesus, for a person who's a Christian, for a person who's been justified before God and declared not guilty, even though we're all those things that we said at the beginning of the sermon, he says, even despite all that, if you come to Christ, you're declared not guilty. So what's our gain? What does a Christian get for coming to Christ? Our gain is that we're now saved from God's wrath, even though we don't deserve to be. But simply, no, no child of God, no, no one who ever comes to Christ, no one who's done that can go to hell now. We're, we're not only saved right now, we're saved forever. If you've trusted Jesus Christ, you, you will not face God's wrath, even though you deserve to face it. And that's what the scripture teaches us. Through Jesus Christ, we who once were enemies of God are now called his friends. Through Jesus Christ, we who once were far away have been brought near to God. We were once aliens and strangers, but now we're a part of God's family. We once had nothing to our credit on our account, but now we're declared heirs of God and joint heirs with Jesus Christ. We're justified by his blood, says verse 9, and we're saved through his life, says verses 10 and 11. Jesus is alive. The grave didn't hold him down. If you're saved, you're only saved right now 
because Jesus came into your life, and guess what he's doing? He's interceding on your behalf in heaven. Hebrews 7, 25. You might jot that down. Hebrews 7, 25 says, Therefore, if he's able to save completely those who come to God through him, because he always lives to intercede for them. That just reminds us Christians this morning that Jesus is our defender. He speaks in our defense, and because... His father is the judge when the son speaks to the father, his plea is always heard. So our impossible problem has been solved completely through Jesus Christ. Listen, in wrapping this up this morning, there are two things, and we see it in the scripture, and I want you to, this is the walk away this morning. There are two things that we have forever if we have Jesus. If you know Christ, don't ever let this push too far away from your heart and your mind. Let's, let's wrap our minds around this. Two very simple statements that help us understand if we have Jesus, we have these things forever. Number one, we have complete certainty of our salvation. Can you be certain that you're going to heaven? Is that possible or is it just wishful thinking? Absolutely, positively, you can know that. If you come to Christ, your past is forgiven by his death. Your present is secure through his intercession like we just talked about in Hebrews. And your future is guaranteed by his promise. And God doesn't go back on his promises. I read a quote this week that's spot on. It says, I often tremble on the rock, but the rock never trembles under me. Romans chapter 8, verse 1. We'll get there in a couple of months as we're walking through Romans. But Romans 8, 1, just looking ahead a little bit, says there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Secondly, not only can we have complete certainty of our salvation, take this as a walk away this morning as well, we have grounds for continual rejoicing. This passage ends with these stirring words in Romans this morning. We also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. Christians ought to be, ought to be, sometimes we fall short in that, but we ought to be the most positive, optimistic people in the world. Now, I'm going to be real honest with you. This COVID-19 stuff's gotten me down. I'm done with it. I'm ready for it to be over. Okay? I'm just speaking the truth. I'm done with it. But we ought to be the most positive, optimistic people in the world. Because despite what's happening in our world and what goes wrong in this fallen world, we have Christ. We have something eternal that can't be taken away. Not fake. I'm not talking about like fake kind of stuff. The true joy that can't be stolen. So we shouldn't be going around like we've been sucking on sour pickles. I mean, we shouldn't be that way. If we have Jesus, it ought not be that way. The word rejoicing is all over Romans chapter 5. It's like Paul expected that we would understand that if we have Christ, it would change the way we view things and the way we deal with things. So verse 11 could be translated this way, we shall be saved rejoicing. Not with sorrowful looks and downcast eyes, not with guilty conscience, but with, because we have the assurance of Christ, the full confidence in Christ. We... Uh, Matthew Henry said this, he said, we not only go to heaven, but we go triumphantly. Not only do we get into the harbor, but we come in with full sail. That's the Christian. Like I said, I'm just being honest. I, I, can I say it? The word hate? I hate this COVID-19 thing. I hate it. It's, uh, and here's what I hate most about it. It's not that I have kind of have unrealistic expectations. We go through tough stuff in life. And this is another one on the list. But I think what I hate about it the most, I told the first service this, and I'll tell y'all. I think what I hate about it the most is the atmosphere of fear that it has created with people. How people have quickly swayed to think that they have to rely on what people are saying or telling them or what they're being told for safety and protection, but the last time I checked, safety and protection is found alone in Jesus Christ. And I'm not saying you don't do smart things and, and, and that all these things are, are bad. That's not, that's not what I'm saying. 
But it's like sometimes people throw that out the door and we forget about eternal security in Christ. So that's the bigger question to me. I think this, y'all have heard me say it several times, I think this platform has opened up opportunities we would not have otherwise had. And we're not out of the out of the woods yet. We're, we're in phase one. And like I said earlier, I, we're, I hope we're making steps to, to come back, and I hope that'll be quick. You know, I had some people asked me this morning, how quickly will we resume everything back to normal? And I hope it's soon. Man, I hope it's yesterday. But it, it's, it's not, and, and, and we will do it as quickly as we can. And I told them, and I'm going to tell you all this morning, and those that are watching right now, I mentioned it, and I'll make it short and sweet, but I'm so thankful for you all. You're an awesome church. It's, it's been very, very cool to see how God's people have responded and stepped up, and nobody's complained, and everybody's just said, whatever we got to do, and people have led through this, and it's been a very, very cool thing, and we'll just keep on keeping on. We'll keep plugging forward through it. I want to end with this in light of the scripture this morning. Do you have assurance of your salvation, the people watching right now, and maybe you've not been coming to church, maybe you didn't come to church before this, and but you've been watching online. Everything we've taught over the last several weeks, and we'll keep on, pushes us to ask this question, do you have assurance of your salvation? Do you know that if you died right now, that you would go to heaven? Would you be saved rejoicing? Do you know Christ? All of these great benefits that we've preached on and taught on for years and years and years in this church and in many other great churches and even over the last several weeks as we've been online and it's been way different, you know, teaching and preaching to a, to a video camera, knowing that, knowing that people are out there and, and knowing that they can fall asleep during your sermons and you can't see them like you do in here when they do it, but knowing all that, Ultimately, the message is, do you know Christ? Are you saved? You have all these benefits that we talked about. You can only have them if you know Christ. Otherwise, you're an enemy of God. What would you do if you don't know Jesus? The Bible says that we must believe in Christ, we must confess in our hearts that we are sinners, and we must ask Jesus Christ to save us that that's salvation. That you're, and it's the only way you can be forgiven. We are weak, ungodly, sinful enemies of God, that we can be pardoned, forgiven, and the slate made clean for us. Do you have that? Are you saved? I'm going to end this worship service a little bit differently than we did the first one because we're on live stream. I want everybody to know that if you don't know Christ, and you need someone to talk to, you can contact us. Y'all that are sitting in here this morning, you can talk to me anytime. You can talk to our staff members, our leaders. If you're watching this morning, you can call me. Um, you can send me an email, you know, pastorcrosshavenchurch.org, and we will find a way to talk about how to know Christ. Listen, so glad that all of you were able to make it in person this morning. We're going to keep on plugging on with a couple of services here for a little while and see how we do it. And I think people start trickling back in. We had a really good crowd in the first service. Y'all keep coming to this one and invite people to come on back. Those that are watching, you keep watching online as long as you need to. When you feel comfortable coming back to worship, we invite you back. We've got a good, safe environment set up here for people to distance here for a while. And we'll push back toward normal. Listen, uh, before we go, let me remind you of a couple of things uh, and then we'll dismiss don't forget uh, that you can give your offerings on the way out. We've got some containers uh, by each door where you can give your offering. That way, we decided not to pass the plate for a while. If you're not on our email list, make sure you let me know that. Send me an email or, or let me know today. We'll add you to our email list because we're sending out our weekly newsletter that way uh, here for a little while. And also sermon notes and things like that. Um, and then we would love, Josh mentioned it at the beginning, we'd love for you to fill out the Connect card today. Um, it's not in your seat backs. All, all of you that are watching, we've got that. It's a, it's a digital Connect card that can be sent to you. We send, send it out on our Remind app. Um, we're going to send it out on our email. You can go to 
uh, our Facebook page, there's a link there, and also go to our app that's been pushed through as, a, as an announcement there, so you can link to that and just fill it out. Even if you're an active church member, you're going to fill that out because we want to see who's coming to which service, and that'll help us as we're planning going forward and deciding, you know, what our next steps will be and how we, you know, how we need to plan out. All right, again, thank y'all for coming today. Y'all are awesome. You have a great afternoon. And we'll, we'll be live streaming Wednesday night, and then we'll be back in person again next week at 9.30 and 11. Y'all have a great afternoon, okay?